The year was 1871, and while the events of this year have been purposefully hidden from the masses, 1871 must never be forgotten. Much like Vatican City and the City of London, Washington, D.C. has its own sovereignty. Basically, D.C., City of London, and Vatican City are totally separate territories from the nations in which they reside. Vatican City is technically enclaved within Rome, outfitted with its own special police force and political structure. The same way the City of London is situated within the city called London, and it has its own flag, crest, police force, ceremonial armed forces, and a mayor. And sure, there are states within the United States that have their own constitution and distinctive flags, but I think most people you'd ask would know that Washington DC isn't a state. Most folks would tell you that Washington DC is where our laws are made, where our politicians congregate, and where our White House resides. But on the DC flag, which is said to have been reflective of George Washington's coat of arms, there are three stars, and I wonder, are those stars representative of the three city-states that exist as corporate entities outside of their respective nations? Vatican City, the religious hub, the city of London, the banking central, and Washington DC, the military leg of the empire. Being its own city-state, DC has its own police force that shares a direct link with Congress, its own mayor, and its own set of laws. But our founding fathers certainly didn't set it up like this, so how did it come to be? The year was 1871. The U.S. was going through a lot of turmoil. The nation was bankrupt and vulnerable after the Civil War, and the London bankers, which included the notorious Rothschild family, were ready to make a deal with Congress to remedy that turmoil. Turmoil, I might add, that is suspected that the bankers had a hand in creating in the first place. At any rate, these bankers made a lot of credit available in the aftermath of the Civil War as a means to, one, fight Lincoln's greenback after he was murdered, with some theorizing that part of the motivation for his assassination came from his push to privatize the monetary system. And the second reason that the bankers made so much credit available was to collect on the interest from those who desperately needed the money, which would be the United States government at the time. Now, this was nothing new. This was a practice as old as time. Well, as old as Mystery Babylon. Not much has really changed since the days of Babylon, not the usury, not the debt slavery, not even the iconography. Passed by Congress, the Act of 1871 provided a government for the 10-mile parcel of land known as the District of Columbia, allowing Washington, D.C. to act as a corporation outside of the original Constitution of the United States. So, okay, why does the Washington, D.C. Constitution have nothing to do with the United States Constitution? Why exactly is Washington, D.C. totally separate from the rest of the United States? Why does it need to be separate from the United States as a separate territory at the epicenter of the Virgin Mary, tucked right between Virginia and Maryland? The Act of 1871 changed our country's founding father's original constitution for the United States for America to the Constitution of the United States of America. If you blink, you might miss it because it's a mixture of impactful wording and some weird capitalization thrown in there that pretty much means nothing to the average person upon initial inspection. But these subtle changes are a huge deal in the realm of legislation. Compounded with these minor changes was clever marketing of the act as a way to unify the territorial government for the entire District of Columbia. The aforementioned are contributing factors as to how such a major act flew under the radar ultimately overturning the United States Constitutional Republic. Since 1871, the federal government has usurped nearly all of the power that was formerly held in the hands of the people. But how on earth was Congress able to pass a separate constitution and incorporate the United States? A bunch of attorneys have contacted me about the subject, explaining it to me. Thank you for everyone who's done that. But let me break it down to you in a way that won't make you just totally fall asleep. A corporation, by definition, is a legal entity separate from its owners. A corporation protects its owners from personal liability for corporate debts and obligations within limits. So was the Act of 1871 as harmless as some claim? Just an act to provide a government for the District of Columbia and nothing more? We can answer that question by simply stepping back and taking a look at the dominoes that fell after this act was passed and asking the question, who benefited from this piece of legislation? 
Is the Act of 1871 the reason why Congress passed the 16th Amendment, which allowed the federal government to tax individual personal income regardless of state population? Is the Act of 1871 the reason why the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was passed? handing over America's gold and silver reserves, and ultimately the total control of America's economy to the Federal Reserve Bank. Think about it, a private corporation established their private bank, acting as the central bank of the United States, but it isn't even a government institution, but a privately owned banking system. Is it a coincidence that social security numbers started being assigned in 1935, social security numbers being the nine digit numbers given to every U US citizen? and used for income tracking and taxation purposes. Ultimately, individual income taxes have been the primary source of revenue for the US federal government since the 1950s. These moves make a lot of sense when examined through the lens of the United States as a corporation and its citizens as employees, a corporate government asset before they even go through puberty. But still, throughout all this time, there was a promise that the American dollar was actually worth something. Something tangible, not just the confidence to exchange it for goods and services. A dollar was worth 1 35th an ounce of gold. But then President Richard Nixon came along and screwed that up for us, severing the final link between the dollar and gold in 1971. In other words, he took the dollar off the gold standard once and for all. Steadily, the purchasing power of the dollar has declined while federal and consumer debt has increased. Currently, we're witnessing the culmination of all of these decisions, and it ain't pretty. We're one bad flu season removed from Weimar Republic wheelbarrow money. So who would you say benefited from the act of 1871? The average US citizen or the bankers who incorporated the United States who have been buying politicians ever since? The same Federal Reserve who serves absolutely no real function except stealing the purchasing power of your 60 plus hour work week and then redistributing those funds to destroy your rights and enslave you on your own soil. Hey, just like they did back in Babylon, it's the same folks using the same debt slavery system, time after time. When will we learn that debt with interest is a system of perpetual debt and is continually passed on to the people beneath until, until the debt gap consumes all but those who own the debt? Well, like I said in the beginning of this video, the most pivotal year in United States history was never taught to me in school, public or private, and never taught to me at a college level. But as Americans, it's so important that we not let this information die with our generation. One of the most important lessons you can teach your children is how to obtain their own freedom, how to identify when their freedoms are being taken from them, and how to demand those personal freedoms and liberties back, instead of waiting around for a hero in the form of a politician to represent them to offer solutions. During this time, we've seen people of all ages crying out for change. And instead of focusing on the changes we could make that could fundamentally change the United States for the better, especially on an individual level, politicians are selling socialism and communism, aka more government control, to young people looking for an answer. And they beg for it because the future seems so bleak. Whether you play with paper or with digital money, the future will always be bleak if you're a debt slave. If before your foot even touches this earth, you're scanned into the system as an employee of this corporation who does not care about you one bit. The United States is still a great country, but it has its problems and you know you can riot and loot and protest all you want, but until the Federal Reserve is ended, until the Act of 1871 is torn into a thousand pieces and thrown into the wind, until the IRS is abolished, and until we move back to the gold standard, we have no chance at experiencing any iota of freedom. What do you think, internet friends? Did you know about the Act of 1871? You know, I always look forward to reading your comments. Thank you so much for sharing this video, for subscribing, and for supporting my channel on Patreon. Bye. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. Either you're with the United States or you're not with the United States. Either you're with us, either you love freedom and with nations which embrace freedom, or you're with the enemy. There's no in-between. You're either with us or you're with the enemy. That's, that's clear. I will continue to make that clear. President Bush made the terms of the war on terror very clear. You're either with us 
or you're with the terrorists? I've, I've had a very good discussion with the president of Yemen. I made it clear to him, as well as other presidents of nations, that you're either with us or you're not with us. Uh, every nation has to either be with us or against us. What we need to do in the first instance, and is the minimal requirement to ascertain whether you're on this side of President Bush's uh, firmly drawn line, with us or against us, are you with the terrorists or are you against the terrorists? There is no middle ground. I think the president enunciated uh, a very clear policy. You're either with us or against us. And then came the speech. You are either with us or against us. And the bombing began. And the old paradigm was restored as our leader encouraged us to show our patriotism by shopping and by volunteering to join groups that would turn in their neighbor for any suspicious behavior. In the 19 months since 9-11, we have seen our democracy com compromised by fear and hatred. Basic inalienable rights, due process, the sanctity of the home have been quickly compromised in a climate of fear. Here's something you're never taught in school. Here in the good old US of A, all of your wars have been fake. I don't mean the actual part where they blow up and kill people. I'm talking about the part where we go to war in the first place. And the sad part about it is the people up at the top and their minions, the people that hang out in these think tanks and stuff, they sit around talking about this blatantly openly, just in your face, strategizing about how they can get us into the next war. And this is actually an old video, but I think it, it bears being shown again. In fact, it should be shown... Once every six months or so, you should just watch it again, just to remind yourself the level that we're at in this country. So the guy, the douchebag you're about to see is from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. This is an American think tank out of Washington, D.C. It was established in 1985, and it says the mission statement of the Institute, quote, is to advance a balanced and realistic understanding of American interests in the Middle East and to promote the policies that secure them. Not about what's right and wrong over there, it's just whatever secures the American interests over in the Middle East, and we all know what those interests are. It has nothing to do with spreading democracy or freedom or liberty. For more on that, all you have to do is look at the board of advisors and look at some of the names on here. You've got Henry Kissinger, Richard Pearl, Condoleezza Rice, George Schultz, James Woolsey. It's a fun crowd. And it doesn't matter which president you think you're voting for, it's going to change everything. People that have been part of this particular think tank have served senior positions in the administrations of every president this country has had since George H.W. Bush. Some of you may have seen this video, but again, considering the things that are going on right now, it's, very, it's more relevant now than it's ever been. So we're going to go ahead and watch this, and I just want to say up front, you're going to want to have to make yourself resist the urge to punch your screen. Because you're going to want to punch this guy. And you don't want to do that because you could cut your knuckles and break your monitor and stuff like that. Because you're, you're going to want to punch him, though. Listen to what he says here. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, he just said that. You aren't hearing things. He literally just said, crisis initiation's tough, and t how's the United States president going to get to war with Iran? Because wars don't just happen. They make the war. Which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. The traditional way that America gets to war is what's best for the interests. Now... Listen to what the traditional way is that America goes to war. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. False flag. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Also a false flag. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall we had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Total false flag. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. Probably also a false flag. May I point out? that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. 
also a false flag. Do you see a pattern here? So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. Period. If the Iranians don't compromise, it would be best if someone started this war. Because that is how America goes to war. You literally have the douchebags who stand up there in these think tanks and say stuff like this. It's not even thinly veiled. There's not even a semantic argument that could be made here that he actually meant something else. He straight up said someone needs to start this war. The way that all of America's other wars have been started. With a false flag. Uh, one can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? <laughs> Somebody actually laughed in the audience when he said that. We can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, it, it's, this is not a, a either-or proposition. You know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. He's not advocating that. He's just suggesting that you can do some things, which is basically the same as advocating it. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. They're in the game of doing that to everybody. This is how America goes to war. You don't know when World War III is going to break out. But when it does, you'll know why. Hey, Internet friends. If the world is a kaleidoscope of color, you and I could be looking at the same sky and see totally different shades of blue. Reality is much the same. In the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with its complex and winding history is one of those reality breakdowns where people come away with drastically different reads of the room based on their upbringing, religious affiliation, schooling, television habits. You know how it is. Only much like COVID and even the war in Ukraine, we are being forced to choose a side. And it's not simply a selection, but a moral decree. An effective way to shatter the calm of the evening is to have an opposing opinion on this issue amongst good company. So today I'm going to give you a historical overview of the Israel and Palestine conflict that is seldom taught in school or even church to better help us navigate the barrage of violent imagery, harrowing headlines, and narratives meant to stir not only emotion, but serve as a call to action. Let's start with the basics. Judaism isn't Zionism. While Zionism is a political philosophy for a certain group of people, Judaism is a religion. Jewish ancestry is not a requirement for practicing Judaism. To be a Zionist, you don't have to be Jewish. The official definition of Zionism is a movement for originally the reestablishment and now the development and protection of a Jewish nation in what is now Israel. Zionism was established as a political organization in 1897. Basically, Zionists believe that according to the Torah, God made a covenant or a sacred agreement with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of Judaism. So in the Old Testament, as it's interpreted by Zionists, God basically acts as a real estate agent and promises Abraham and his descendants a specific land, often referred to as the promised land or the land of Canaan. The land is described in various passages in the Bible and it includes the territory that makes up modern-day Israel, as well as parts of surrounding areas. If you're new here, I'm from the Bible Belt of the United States, where Christian Zionism is widespread. Believe in that Israel and the Jews are the chosen people and that Israel is the promised land for Jews is taught in church as a gateway to salvation and eternal life. Keep in mind that as Christians, we are also taught that the way to eternal life and salvation is through Christ, whom religious Jews reject, and they also reject the idea of hell or eternal damnation. And I just want to remind Christians who might be watching that everything changed with the New Testament, which is why Christians are taught from both the Old and New Testament. Remember, Jesus rolled up, started performing miracles, flipping over tables of money changers, and said, it doesn't matter who you are, how much money you got, who your daddy is. As long as you walk with Christ, you're chosen for eternal salvation. 
And this changed everything. It gave everyday people hope and put them on an even playing field. Jewish point of view, or we don't believe in the divinity of Christ. I right. think that the, there you can make an argument that the the Gospels, which were written, he was just a signif- prophet. And right? significant. No, no, no. We don't uh, even believe he was a prophet. What do you think he was? What do you guys? I, think I, he I was? mean, I, what I what do I think he was historically? I think he was a Jew who tried to lead a revolt against the Romans and got killed for his trouble. But just like Christians, there are certain sects of Judaism that believe one thing, and other Jews believe something else. So Jews who follow the Babylonian Talmud, a rabbinical text, are taught that there is a distinction between Jews who are considered the chosen people in Jewish theology and those who are not Jewish. The word used to describe the non-Jewish, including Christians, is goyim or goy. It is a derogatory Yiddish term meaning cattle or beast, often used in place of the word Gentile. And this distinction or this perception, well, it just totally discards the concept of an even playing field. The perception of the self, the teachings are inherently otherly in ways that others could never achieve if they weren't born into it. The first big departure from Israel happened during the Babylonian exile, almost 600 years before Christ when King Nebuchadnezzar II of the Babylonian empire took over Jerusalem and destroyed the first temple, Solomon's temple. Then Rome conquered Jerusalem in 70-ish AD, destroying the second temple, the central hub of Jewish worship and sacrifice. About 70 years later, the Romans changed the name of the area from Judea to Palestina. Okay, so like I said, the original Bible Jews fled Judea to surrounding areas throughout the centuries. But there's a key event that happened in Jewish history that no one really ever addresses. And I'm just going to warn you, it's a highly debated event. It really gets people worked up to talk about it. During the Middle Ages, between the 7th and 10th centuries, the kingdom of Khazaria ruled over parts of Russia, Kazakhstan, and modern-day Ukraine. So under the Khazarian Empire, the kingdom made all the civilians who were reportedly polytheistic and pagan, they made them convert to Judaism. And it's believed that the decision to convert was a political choice to stay independent and avoid religious pressures from the Christian Byzantine Empire to the west and the Islamic Caliphate to the south. Meaning that Khazarians were not necessarily Jews in the sense that Bible Jews were, if that makes sense. They had the identity, but not the connection to ancient Israel. After the fall of the Khazarian Empire in the 10th century, Khazarians migrated and integrated across Europe. In all fairness, it should be noted that a bunch of Jews call the Khazar history a conspiracy theory. They say it's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Even though you can open up a history book and it's right there, so I don't know what to tell you. Chinese Muslims don't pretend they're Arabs, but white Europeans claim to be Bible Israelites, and we all just pretend that's perfectly normal. Eventually, Jewish people arrived in Western Europe and America, and forgive me because it's getting a little dicey here, making the distinction between Bible Jews and converted Jews, but apparently it's an important distinction because it determines whether America is willing to send billions of tax dollars and soldiers to a nation. So we've got to at least touch on the difference. So let's fast forward to the late 1800s when Zionism allegedly got its start in response to the resurgence of anti-Semitism. By the way, anti-Semitism before the definition was changed in like 2016 used to mean hostility towards Semites. A Semite being a member of any of the peoples who speak or spoke a Semitic language, including in particular the Jews and the Arabs. Now it just means hatred of Jewish people. When Zionism was just getting traction, among the considerations for a Jewish state were Argentina, Uganda, Cyprus, and even Texas. Throughout the early 1900s, numerous Zionist groups began to pop up across the United States, with their various publications serving as a vehicle for Zionist propaganda. The goal was to influence both the United States Congress and the general public. Though the sentiment amongst U.S. officials at the time was that Zionism countered both U.S. interests and principles, since it involved matters related to other countries other than the United States. Clearly, much has changed since then. But then the world descended into war. A secret deal called the Sykes-Picot Treaty was made during World War I, the result of which was bringing down the Ottoman Empire. The treaty was made public in 1916 and set new borders for the Middle East. 
splitting the area into states. And Palestine was put under international control. But strangely enough, the Balfour Declaration, which was written in a letter to Walter Rothschild by the UK's Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, promised Palestine as a home for the Jewish people. And this letter was sent just one year after the Sykes-Picot Treaty. It's important to remember that the Rothschild banking family actively funded both sides of the war. This was also done during World War II because countries at war needed money to do things like feed and arm their men. But for Rothschild Zionism, making money was just the cherry on top. They needed Jewish people to be traumatized. They needed Jewish people to have a reason to live in fear and want to migrate to Israel which would serve as a hub to help them rule the Middle East, and they needed global superpowers to back them up. But even before World War II, Zionists were busy buying up land in Palestine and moving there. Palestine was a place where Jews, Christians, and Muslims already lived. The Zionist Federation of Germany and the Nazi government signed the Havara Agreement in 1933. This made it easier for German Jews to move to Palestine. And it let Jewish people in Germany move some of their wealth out of Germany by buying things made in Germany to send to Palestine. Jews who had left their homes used the money they made from selling these goods in Palestine to settle down there. As a result of the deal, about 60,000 German Jews moved to Palestine before it was officially ended when World War II broke out in 1939. Before the state of Israel was officially established, the Palestinians revolted. Sinus said this was because of their anti-Semitism, but Palestine was their home, and the Arabs knew it was being attacked and taken away from them. Were they just supposed to, I don't know, give away their homes and family farms without a peep? Y'all like, oh, no problem, we'll just bulldoze our homes ourselves. That's just a little bit unrealistic, don't you think? 700,000 Palestinians were forced from their homes when the state of Israel was created. Some people might call this an ethnic cleansing of the land. More and more Palestinian land has been claimed by Israel every year since its creation. And every day there is a war. In 1967, Israel was at war with six surrounding Arab states. As a result, Israel won and took over the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and of course, the Syrian Golan Heights. The UN has asked Israel to leave these lands to give them back, but they have held on to them, which has created extremely high tensions in the region, giving rise to extremist groups, which are then funded by the CIA and Mossad and whoever else, so they can control the opposition, which is always their MO. Zionists say that their treatment of Palestinians is okay because after World War II, everyone abandoned Israel. They were truly on their own and surrounded by people who didn't like them being there. The excuse for their aggression was that they were protecting themselves. After all, Jewish Zionists believe that they are God's chosen people and that this land was given to them by God and it's their duty, their manifest destiny, if you will, to take it. This argument, this whole argument has transformed into, do we not have a right to protect ourselves in the face of such extreme anti-Semitism? Let's call a spade a spade. It's all a bit gaslighty. As part of Zionism's manifest destiny, there is perpetual war and death in the Middle East. The United Nations doesn't punish Israel for their violations of human rights as they grow into the greater Israel. Even so, Resolution 3379 of the UN General Assembly in 1975 said that Zionism was a form of racism and racial discrimination. This decision was taken away in 1991. Still, it seems like Israel is a Jewish state, but only for a certain kind of Jewish people. The Palestinian Jews who were there the entire time and the Ethiopian Jews who moved there in the 1980s and early 1990s aren't wanted there. Bethlehem, historically associated with Jesus Christ, has seen its Christian population decrease significantly, from 80% in the 1920s to just 20% today. A similar decline has occurred throughout Palestine, where Christians now make up only about 1% of the population. Some people might say that this decline is because of tensions in the Middle East between Palestinian Muslims and Christians. However, however, a study from 2017 found that the main reason Palestinian Christians left was the pressure of Israeli occupation. The study reported that ongoing restrictions, unfair laws, random arrests, and land seizures are some of the things that make Palestinian Christians feel hopeless. 
Every day for decades, the Israelis and the Palestinians are at war with each other. Eventually, Israel put up a wall between territories, effectively surrounding the Palestinian population of 2 million like their caged animals, providing only a couple of guarded exits. Palestinian civilians often get caught up in the crossfire, leaving their hospitals, schools, and homes destroyed by Israel. Meanwhile, Israel built their Iron Dome missile defense system in the 2000s to defend against rocket threats from Hezbollah and Hamas. The United States funds both sides of the conflict, giving Palestinians $600 million annually and Israel around $3.3 billion in foreign aid annually. To wrap it all up here, Israel has and continues to commit human rights violations against Palestinian civilians which have been documented by the UN and human rights organizations. There are repeated examples, daily tragedies that global superpowers have turned a blind eye to. Presumably in the United States, it's because the Zionist lobby has a great deal of power over the politicians. Any criticism of Israel and its practices gets shut down by accusations of anti-Semitism before one sentence ever leaves your mouth. And of course, the Palestinians hate the Israelis. Of course, the Israelis hate the Palestinians. Who is right? Who is wrong? Do you actually believe that the same media who lied to get us into every major war, Vietnam, the Gulf Wars into the war on drugs, intact passports at the bottom of the Twin Tower rubble, war on terrorism, COVID, mass saves lives, Ukraine, do you actually believe they're telling you the truth about what happened in the last few weeks between Israel and Palestine? The events of which will inevitably escalate and lead to greater involvement of global superpowers and eventually cost the lives of many American soldiers? Do you actually believe that they're telling you the truth? If everything went down exactly as the media reported, of course Hamas is in the wrong for killing Israeli civilians. The whole sophistication of the Israeli intelligence and military surveillance apparatus being down during that particular time is a little suspect, but I digress. I hope that if you're a Christian, you'll consider what I've said. I know you're good people. I know you have big hearts, and I know you hate to see others suffer. But if you're going to cheer on the genocide of an entire population and beg for Americans to get involved, I hope and pray that you know the true identity and intent of our greatest ally in the Middle East. Because by your logic, you're basing your entire eternal salvation on supporting them and their actions. Just make sure that you're sure. That's all. By the way, I wish we had a single politician who was as fired up about what's happening in the United States as they are about Israel. Wouldn't that be something? What if people directed their energy towards bankers and puppeteers funding both sides of the conflict instead of choosing a side in this false dichotomy. What do you think, internet friends? I'm sure I've upset some of you by saying this. I just humbly ask for your consideration of what I've laid out here. And, you know, I contemplated a long time about doing this video and I still felt like after a week, it was important enough to post. aproape de noi în momentul ăsta și se pare că s-au oprit. Cu siguranță este și infanteria uh, israeliană care interceptează toate aceste bombe. O să mai rămânem așa puțin pentru că niciodată nu știi exact când se opresc bombardamentele. Hey internet friends, today marks the 50th anniversary of the attack on the virtually unarmed American naval vessel, the USS Liberty. Positioned 17 miles off the Gaza coast, the Liberty's mission was to intercept communications at the height of the Six-Day War. Well, until the ship was attacked by Israel, then the only thing they were intercepting was torpedoes and bombs and bullets and napalm. Despite the attack taking place in full daylight, 
with the American flag on display. And even though Israel basically shrugged and said whoopsie daisy, labeling the attack as a case of mistaken identity, perhaps the most shocking part of this attack is that it's missing from our history books. Did you ever learn about the Liberty attack in school? I sure didn't. One of the biggest untold stories in our past history deserves some spotlight, don't you think? Just to be fair here, you could replace Israel with any ally attacking the United States in this tale, and the point still stands. With 34 American sailors killed and 172 injured that day, Israel committed acts of war that the United States has covered up for 50 years. At the beginning of every school day, children across America pledge allegiance to the United States of America, not the United States of Israel or the United States of Switzerland or, or, what, or any other nation. Our tax dollars go towards the future generation's education, an education riddled with as many holes as a piece of Swiss cheese. How can we flourish in the land of opportunity, the land of the free, the home of the brave and all of that jazz, when our government continues to operate in such a treasonous fashion? lining their pockets with the endless cash flow from foreign lobbyists. You tell me, and while you're noodling on your answer, I'll tell you about the USS Liberty attack that took place half a century ago. On June 8, 1967, a crew of 294 men were patrolling in the international waters of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. At 2 p.m., the USS Liberty crew noted three surface radar contacts, followed up by a high-speed aircraft passing over the ship. In a little while later, without any warning, an Israeli fighter aircraft launched a rocket attack at the American ship, following up with a healthy dose of cannon fire and napalm. Israeli forces jammed the ship's communications. They targeted the ship's command bridges, so the Liberty's crew didn't have the easiest time contacting the United States Navy's Sixth Fleet. It's important to note that prior to this attack, there was no fire directed from the Liberty to the aircraft. The Israeli aircrafts attacked in a crisscross fashion over the ship, striking in 45 second to one minute intervals, and even though the commanding officer of the Liberty was injured from the shrapnel, he managed to grab a camera and photograph the aircraft. And that was only the attack from the sky. Following the air attack, torpedo boats flying Israeli flags were noted, and the Liberty crew replaced their American flag with a larger American flag in an effort to signal that they were not the enemy. The Israeli torpedo strikes that followed rendered the USS Liberty dead in the water, with all power and steering control lost. Survivors reported that Israeli torpedo boat crews swept the decks with continuous machine gun fire, targeting communications equipment and any crew members above deck. And when the captain gave the order to prepare to abandon ship, the torpedo boat crews targeted inflated lifeboats with their machine gun fire. Two helicopters bearing the Star of David were noted, passing over and around the ship, but were not observed to pick up any persons or bodies or debris. So why don't we dive into the murky waters of speculation? Why would Israel attack the United States? What could be their motivation, their goal? Was it really a case of mistaken identity? The attack occurred in broad daylight, amid excellent weather conditions, with both the American flag and the vessel number identifiable from the air. In an article released by the Chicago Tribune in 2007, it was revealed that the transcripts from the Israeli Air Force showed that pilots who flew over the Liberty saw a U.S. flag. Can we clearly define what the Israeli motive was for attacking an American ship if they did indeed know the identity of the ship. The United States chose to stay out of the six-day war between Israel and Jordan, Syria, and Egypt, despite Israel's requests for military support. Perhaps Israel felt a bit betrayed. A popular hypothesis is that Israel wanted to pull a false flag to rope in the United States into war with Egypt. Another hypothesis to throw out there deals with intelligence, since the Liberty was collecting intel. And perhaps some of what they collected, Israel did not want revealed, thus the attack. While asking why Israel would attack an American ship, their ally, 
is an important series of questioning. Perhaps asking why the Sixth Fleet abandoned the Liberty is a more important series of questioning. The Liberty's radio sent a brief distress message that was acknowledged by the Sixth Fleet, who were nearby in the Mediterranean. The director of the CIA during the 1967 attack, Richard Helms, elaborated on the final investigation of the USS Liberty, saying, Israeli authorities subsequently apologized for the incident, but few in Washington could believe that the ship had not been identified as an American naval vessel. Later, an interim intelligence memorandum concluded that the attack was a mistake and not made in malice against the U.S. I have yet to understand why it was felt necessary to attack this ship, or who ordered the attack. Congress never investigated the Liberty attack, making the Liberty the only attack on a United States Navy ship involving significant loss of life that has not been investigated in this way. In fact, after the attack, nearly all the evidence pertaining to it remained highly classified. Did the White House fear conflict with Israel? Did they fear conflict enough to sacrifice their own servicemen for the benefit of a foreign nation? A nation who committed war crimes against us? Although the surviving crew members were awarded medals of honor for their plight, they've been vilified for claiming the attack was in any way deliberate on Israel's behalf. Terms like neo-Nazis, conspiracy theorists, and anti-Semites have been used to describe the survivors of the attack in their efforts to pursue a transparent investigation. Are these men neo-Nazis for telling the truth? Are they conspiracy theorists for wanting an open and transparent investigation? Are they anti-Semites for having the audacity to survive? Are the abbreviated lives of the sons, brothers, fathers, and husbands not worth a mention or even a sentence in our history books because they fell at the hands of God's chosen people? Were they not God's people too? I survived the two-hour Israeli attack on the U.S. Naval Intelligence ship USS Liberty AGTR-5. On June 8, 1967, during the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War, Israel tried to sink the ship, attempting to murder the crew of 294 Americans. They launched five torpedoes, but our captain, William McGonigal, asservedly dodged four of them. However, the fifth hit us on our starboard side, just forward of the midships, killing 25 of the 34 Americans. A little after 2 p.m., three Israeli unmarked fighter jets began strifing the ship with 20-millimeter cannon and rockets, killing the young sailors manning the 50-caliber machine guns. The radium men immediately tried to call for help, discovered all U.S. selected frequencies were jammed. The Israelis knew the frequencies were attempting to use. Nevertheless, the radium men finally got through to the Sixth Fleet. No help was forthcoming that day as the Sixth Fleet had White House orders not to launch aircraft to come to our aid. Next came two fighter, fighter bombers that dropped napalm canisters on each side of the ship. Even though they were being shot at, the Liberty crew eventually put out the fires. After a brief lull, three torpedo boats arrived, strafing the ship with their 40 millimeter cannon and 50, 50 millimeter sh machine guns. Then they proceeded to drop their torpedoes in the water. One finally did find its mark. Our skipper passed a command to prepare to abandon ship. Three inflatable life rafts that remained seaworthy were dropped over the side and were machine gunned by the motor torpedo boats. Our life vests were now our only hope for survival and the more seriously wounded would never survive. However, the engine room was able to bring the boilers back to life and the Liberty had power. And in addition, a damage control indicated that the ship stopped taking on war, water and the ship came to a nine degree list to starboard. So our captain wisely decided not to abandon ship. In order to secure the Jewish vote for an up upcoming elections, they could not have Israel taken the test. This was a major historical event any other time their action would have been an act of war. The event had to be buried quickly, quietly, and without fanfare. Therefore, a couple of actions were taken immediately. The Navy told the Liberty survivors never to talk about the attack to anyone, including our families, or face a $10,000 fine or ten, and or 10 years imprisonment. We now know the order came from Mayush Dayan. <clears throat> we have declassified CIA cable exposing his order. One of the generals in the room that morning explained 
This is pure murder. But they went ahead as the order came from the defense minister until an, an IDF Navy admiral later gave the order to stop the attack as the ship refused to sink. You see, their war plans included taking Syrian territory, the Golan Heights. By June 8th, the IDF had taken out the air forces of Jordan, Egypt, and Syria, captured the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, and the Sinai. These myths matter. Israel is historically Jewish territory. According to the Bible and certain interpretations of contemporaneous archaeology, Joshua entered the land of Israel in 1400 BC. The Kingdom of David was founded around 1000 BC. The first Temple of Solomon was built in approximately 957 BC. They talk about the USS Liberty incident. I have to say I'm a little bit bewildered why you're so obsessed with an incident that is now 52 years old. Hey, Internet friends. Throughout history, we've seen empires rise and we've seen them fall. But people remain, even though their right to exist is questioned. Our time to speak about apartheid and ethnic cleansing and even question history and propaganda is coming to a close on the internet. And perhaps in real life, as videos are being flagged, search results are being filtered, history is being erased, while individuals who dare question the narrative they're being fed are labeled extremists spouting hate speech, and sometimes are even jailed as a result. So while we can, we should talk about things that matter, like the individuals and situations that play a direct role in wars, in rumors of wars, as we all exist in a state of endless war. And there are some folks who'd like to keep it that way because it benefits them. That's why today we're going to talk about the Golan Heights, or the Syrian Golan two-thirds of which are occupied by Israel, serving as the epicenter of conflict in the Middle East. Within the hotbed of chaos, it's a curious cast of familiar characters, stoking the flames and collecting the spoils of war under the banner of a company by the name of Genie Energy. We are the masters of our fate. That the task which has been set us is not above our strength. That its pangs and toils are not beyond our endurance. As long as we have faith in our cause and uh, an unconquerable willpower, salvation will not be denied us. How did we get to this point with Damascus laid to waste in an endless array of breaking news headlines relaying that an impending world war is about to pop off at any moment? Well, we've got to talk about black gold. With the Ottoman Empire first discovering oil in the Baku-Azerbaijan region in 1846, becoming the world's top producing region at the time and later being pumped out of the ground by the Nobel brothers under the Bronabell Oil Company. But soon Rockefeller's American Standard Oil Company entered the black city of Baku. The Rothschilds, who make their association with the Vatican no secret, were there too. Developing a fleet of oil tankers to operate in the Caspian Sea in 1898, while in 1908, the British Burma Oil Company, owned by British royals and known today as BP, discovered oil in modern-day Iran, which fueled exploration and exploitation of a region once called Persia. And in 1911, the Royal Dutch Shell Company bought the Azerbaijan oil fields from the Rothschild family. It's important to note that during World War I, which resulted in the fall of the Ottoman Empire, a secret agreement took place called the Sykes-Picot Treaty. And this treaty was whipped up in 1916 by two British and French diplomats, dividing the region into states, which splintered ethnic and religious communities that were once united. And under that treaty, Palestine was placed under international control. Post-World War I, the Brits assumed control over Palestine. And only one year after the Sykes-Picot Treaty was signed came the Balfour Declaration. Nestled in a letter between the United Kingdom's Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour and addressed to Walter Rothschild, promising Palestine as a home for the Jewish people. Keep in mind, this declaration was Tolkien Zionism, or the Jewish Nationalist Movement supporting a Jewish national state in Palestine. This was in 1917, promised to the same people who funded the Bolshevik communist revolution that same year, with Lenin attacking Baku, igniting all of the oil frameworks and machinery, ensuring that communist Russia wouldn't be dabbling in the oil game. And the destruction of Baku resulted in a skyrocket in oil prices, meaning a payday for the rest of the players. But we all gotta get by with a little help from our friends, right? Before he was the Prime Minister of Britain, 
before he ever helped lead the Allied forces to victory. Winston Churchill was born into an aristocratic family, with its father being a member of the noble Spencer family and his mother, Jenny Jerome, a Jewish American dynast whose status could be compared to a modern day Paris Hilton or Nicole Richie. As First Lord of the Admiralty in the 1920s, Churchill was drooling over some oil, and the Burma Oil Company employed Churchill, paying him to lobby the British government to allow Burma's Anglo-Persian oil business to have exclusive rights to the Persian oil. In serving as Secretary of State for the colonies, Churchill drew borders in the Middle East, grabbing more oil for the British Navy. Take note of this pattern while I summarize. The oil industry was booming pre-World War I, pumping out oil in the Ottoman Empire, and instead of competing for the prize, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds became a team, and essentially took out the rest of the competition, while simultaneously funding the perfect environment for war and rumors of wars, creating a domino effect of chaos that worked in their favor. Palestine was already promised to the Rothschilds, in wars and atrocities to get the entire world behind the state of Israel and scare the Jewish population were funded by the same folks to which the state was promised. We do everything possible to prevent the emergence of another front of terror, front against us at the Golan Heights. This is the red line we have marked. We cannot go back to the days when our villages and our children were shot at from the Golan Heights. And that is why, in the framework of the agreement or without it, the Golan Heights will remain a part of sovereign Israel. The State of Israel was declared in 1948, but technically the land was Palestine, so Palestinians lived there. And ever since the creation of Israel, there's been bloodshed. In fact, there's never been friendly relations between Israel and its neighbors. The Six Day War of 1967 was basically Israel against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Since Israel's neighbors saw Israel as an illegitimate state, Egypt decided it was going to liberate the Palestinian state. Israel attacked first, by air, on Egyptian airfields, and as a result, Syria and Jordan attacked Israel. But Israel defeated all of them, occupying land that allegedly held a historical significance to Israel and mirrored what some refer to as the Greater Israel Plan. Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula, but began settling other claimed lands, including the Golan Heights, which Israelis claim Syrians were using the strategic location to fire upon other Israelis. Since the Six Day War, Israel annexed the Golan Territory in the 1980s. Though even to this day, Israeli settlements and building there is internationally considered to be illegal. Of course, Syria wants the return of the territory and herein lies the main reason for the continued conflict. Especially since Israel continues to take advantage of Syria's chaos as a means of settling in the Golan. Sound familiar? Sound like a familiar pattern? Well, this brings us to the main point of the video. Genie Energy, a company based in Newark, New Jersey. A company that has a lot of interest in this unlawfully occupied territory, at which there's been, at least what the news reports, a recent discovery of major oil reserves. But that's not terrible, right? People have a right to side with Israel and make a dollar doing so. That's capitalism. But wait, hold up. Should members of our government, former or current, be doing that? Buying off illegally occupied territory sold by Israel? Setting an international precedent for any country to invade and occupy a weaker one and gut them for their resources? Well, should they? Should that be allowed? Let's take a closer look. On the board of Genie Energy sits Jacob Rothschild, Dick Cheney, former vice president, defense secretary, and Halliburton CEO. Rupert Murdoch, founder of News Corporation and Fox News. Larry Summers, former Secretary of the Treasury. James Woolsey, former Director of the CIA. Bill Richardson, former Governor and Energy Secretary under the Clinton administration. Mary Landrieu, who is a former Senator who sponsored the Israeli-US Energy Bill. And finally, Michael Steinhardt, Wall Street investor. Been involved with a number of administrations in the Middle East over the years, obviously. The effort's always been to try to get the peace process going between Israel and the Palestinians. And what they're essentially doing, these white helmets, and I really want to stress this point because it's part of the overall scheme of propaganda and demonization. They're white helmets by day and terrorists by night. You see many of these people that are dressed in their pristine white outfits um, and white helmets that 
pretend to be rescuing civilians. In other instances, you see the same characters holding their weapons and posing as rebels. No. This is the, um, the scandalous uh, hypocrisy of the West. Not only has the West been funding and training and arming terrorists to go into Syria and to behead and slaughter Syrian civilians, but now the West wants to award the White Helmets with the Nobel Peace Prize. In recent years, the United States repealed the propaganda ban, signing off on the National Defense Authorization Act, which included an amendment that legalized the use of propaganda on the American public, making it legal for information and psychological operations aimed at influencing public opinion to be implemented by the United States government. So is this why the White Helmets, or voluntary rescue workers in Syria, who are pumping out propaganda by day, with a chunk of the White Helmets murdering civilians by night. Is this why they were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize? Is this why Christians, Jews, Muslims, atheists, and innocent folks in Syria are being killed? Is this why American soldiers are dying for the sponsored war on terrorism? So places like Syria can be shattered into a thousand different pieces. Have a puppet leader installed and the spoils of war are there for the taking. Is this all to benefit the strategic interests of a few? In my opinion, there is nothing more un-American than companies like Genie Energy. There is nothing more un-American than the United States Incorporated. A hundred years ago, the same folks were fighting over this oil like they are now. Oil was known to be in the Golan before the Brits took over Palestine, even before the Balfour Declaration because BP drilled there just like the Ottomans did a hundred years ago. Rothschild and co clearly knew there was black gold there before it was discovered. So why would these politicians and former government officials who sit on the board of Genie Energy ever promote peace in the Middle East when they profit from war? A peaceful solution would involve giving the Golan back to Syria and therefore forfeiting Genie Energy's cash cow, if oil is all they're up to. If I've been successful at communicating the point of this video, you can see that it's a tale as old as time. So now, what's the solution? Steve, Steve Byrne calls me and Steve Byrne goes, you want to go to Israel? I go, why? <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, right? He goes, it's free. They'll fly you out. You Come on, you didn't do birthright and pretended you were Jewish. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that. No, but he said, um, no, the, the government, Israeli government is flying out like celebrities for free out there to do a tour for free, and it's on the house. They fly you first class, the whole thing. Wow. And I go, oh, who's going? He goes, it's going to be me, you, George Lopez, Jamie Chung, Brian Greenberg, her husband. I like it. I'm I like, love I, him. I love Brian, right? And I go, it's free? And they go, yeah, it's not free. Because when you land there, they go, you have to every day tweet positive things about, about Israel. Israel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I just felt so uneasy. Uh, uneasy about it yeah but couldn't you just go why do you because you have because you have a lot of palestinian friends yeah i mean i know some you know what i mean i don't know much about it i just know that they're in conflict and it's just like but i did i did what they said hey internet friends to speak about israel and the extreme zionist influence over our government is a discussion that should really be taking place but is muffled by accusations of anti-semitism often when there is dissent expressed in the United States against policies of the Israeli government. Um, uh, people here are called anti-Semitic. Uh, what is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? Well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe somebody is criticizing Israel, then we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country people are criticizing Israel, then they are anti-Semitic. Which is funny because by definition, a Semite is a member of any of the peoples who speak or spoke a Semitic language, including in particular the Jews and the Arabs. And I can, with impunity, criticize the rest of the Middle East who are also Semites because the definition of anti-Semitism only refers to the prejudice against Jews. But I totally get it. Up until very recently, I believed that anyone who questioned Israel was a neo-Nazi. Back in high school, I attended this church where they'd passed the plate around the congregation, once for donations to the church, and a second time for Israel, the holy land of God's oppressed but chosen people, the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament. But I digress. I get the sense that a lot of you who watch this channel are Christians, 
So maybe you've shared in my experience of Christian Zionism. Maybe you still subscribe to that belief system, and you'll find this video incredibly offensive. I recommend you crack open the Talmud, the cornerstone of rabbinical education, which calls on Christians to be harmed both directly and indirectly. But I'm sure I'll have someone comment saying the mere fact that I brought up the Talmud is anti-Jewish slander. It's old religious fanaticism. And since I'm not Jewish, I couldn't possibly understand the laws that are written and quote them in context. But on the flip side, we can bring up any other religious texts like the Quran and pick it apart with virtually no repercussions. The time is drawing near when the window of opportunity to speak freely will eventually vanish. In some parts of the world, there are laws and consequences for anti-Semitic speech. And day by day, the internet is becoming more and more censored for those of us who just want to know the truth about the Middle East. And in doing so, we have to take Israel into consideration because they're part of the Middle East. And to further that problem, Israel has hired university students to post pro-Israel messages on social media networks without needing to identify themselves as government linked. I came here to learn more about how um, we as Israelis and as Jews can defend Israel online, on the internet, and particularly in Wikipedia in this case. Wikipedia is a bit of a complex system and it's sometimes hard to figure out the rules. I've personally tried to edit things um, in Wikipedia that were against Israel. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? We can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. Have you ever heard about the day Israel attacked America, also known as the USS Liberty Incident? of 1967. During the Six-Day War, 34 American servicemen were slaughtered and 173 more were wounded after Israeli forces repeatedly attacked USS Liberty in international waters. The Liberty was not a battleship and was entirely unable to defend itself. For decades, the US government threatened survivors with jail if they spoke about it and kept the truth from the public. Survivors of the attack have long maintained that Israel intended to kill the entire crew and sink the USS Liberty as a means of scapegoating the blame for the incident onto Egypt. But why would Israel want the US to believe that Egypt was responsible for the attack? It's a classic false flag, right? Shifting the blame for an incident as a means of drawing the president or the US public into declaring war on Egypt. Well, Israel claims that this attack was done in error. Audio evidence confirms that the Israelis knew the identity of the ship as an American vessel. Furthermore, did you know that Israel has nuclear weapons? In 1986, an Israeli whistleblower and former nuclear technician revealed that Israel had amassed a secret stockpile of nuclear weapons. This whistleblower spent 18 years in prison after revealing classified information and in 2014, a lawsuit was filed against U.S. charities that funded Israel's secret nuclear weapon program. I don't know all the facts. I don't think we all know all the facts, but I was deeply concerned that uh, this could have been, um, uh, you know, another cons uh, organized, highly organized attack on the country. And it still may be, I, again, I don't know the facts, but I do know that it's really hard to protect the homeland. What has the media told us about 9-11? Before the attacks, there were many stories coming out about Israeli espionage on the United States. Did you know about the Israeli art students who occupied two entire floors of at least one tower? Did you know about the Israelis arrested on 9-11? Did you know that at the time, Mossad had an urban moving company as a front? They were seen by New Jersey residents on September 11th, seemingly celebrating the fall of the World Trade Centers and photographing themselves in front of the wreckage. These men were caught by police, held for questioning, and quickly sent back to Israel by the United States government. So did Mossad know about the attack on the Twin Towers before it happened? Did they have a crew ready to film it? What do we actually know? 
very little because it's anti-Semitic to bring it up. What has the media told you about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Israel has successfully wanted to prove to the world that it is an innocent victim of the Palestinian violence and terror, and that the Arabs and Muslims have no other reason to be in conflict with Israel except for an irrational hatred of Jews. And most of what we see on the news is Palestine as the aggressor and very little of how Israel responds. And don't get me wrong, Israel has a right to defend themselves from attacks, but for over five decades now, they have killed Palestinians with impunity. There seems to be a hierarchy of death propagated in our media, and when we see certain groups of people, as less than other groups of people. That's when the injustice occurs, unchallenged and leaving room for prejudice to fester. An example of this would be Israel's use of white phosphorus targeting densely populated areas of Gaza. So this is uh, basically something that is mandatory, that every congressperson has to sign saying that, what, Jerusalem, you said, is the capital of Israel, and what else? Uh, uh, you make a commitment that you will vote to support the military superiority of Israel, that um, uh, the economic assistance that Israel wants, that you would uh, vote to provide that. What have you learned about ISIS from the media? I've learned that ISIS has attacked the USA. ISIS has attacked France. ISIS has attacked the Philippines. ISIS even boasted that they were going to destroy Kaaba in Mecca. But ISIS doesn't attack just around the corner Israel. I guess they would rather attack distant countries. In 2015, Syrian President Assad spoke about the connection between ISIS and Israel. He responded for the first time to an airstrike attributed to Israel, saying it's very clear that Israel supports the rebels because whenever we make advances in some place, they attack in order to undermine the army. That's why some in Syria joke, how can you say that Al-Qaeda doesn't have an air force? They have the Israeli Air Force. Even as early as this morning, a Syrian UN envoy claimed that Israel was directly supporting ISIS by bombing regime sites. There have been claims made that Israel is the largest buyer of ISIS oil, but whenever I search for sources to verify or debunk this claim, all I find are long rants on anti-Semitism. In 2015, NATO said it wouldn't send ground troops in to fight ISIS. Is it because ISIS is actually our ally and the goal is to overthrow Assad in Syria and install a Israel and United States friendly puppet government instead of the Russia-Iran puppet that's currently in place? I'm just really, really confused. Israel can stop ISIS, but they can't stop people from throwing rocks at them. Is that, do I have it right? I'm just really confused because in order to have clarity on something, one must have answers to their questions. And in order to get answers to your questions, it must first be acceptable to ask them. When I see things like evidence and the money trail to support that my government is acting like a cheap whore, selling out to the highest bidder, it makes me think that we'll never find anything that remotely resembles peace. As long as the wolves among people are above the law. What difference at this point does it make? Those weapons of mass destruction gotta be somewhere. Nope, no weapons over there. We should not argue in the context of yesterday. We should really first analyze how the world has dramatically changed and is changing in an accelerating way. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Like nothing gets done Living by a bad truth Swallow it like who knows